You're listening to the VBMA Podcast. The AVMA is your association. Whether you're looking for professional resources or no-cost insurance options for SABMA members, the AVMA family of AVMA and AVMA Trust have your back. Simmons Educational Fund, a proud sponsor of AVMA, exists to support the veterinary profession through business education. Each year, veterinary students are invited to apply for the SEF Business Aptitude Award, one of the largest awards of its kind. To learn more about SEF, visit SimmonsEdFund.org. That's SimmonsEdFund.org. For the past 20 years, Nationwide has been honored to stand as a founding sponsor of the BBMA. Our goal is to help provide relevant educational content to empower aspiring veterinarians to take a holistic approach to pet health care and meet pet families where they are. especially for new grads, looking at all these shiny flashy contracts and how do we choose the best one? How do we choose one that fits our lifestyle? Um, And what even do I do when I'm handed a contract for the first time? Um, So I guess kind of to kick it off, like what are your thoughts right off the bat, Dr. Odie? Uh, First of all, call me Odie, number one. Let's start with that. Back in those days, we had more candidates than we had positions. So I spent entire days, if not two days, finding the right candidates for our openings. Today, the world is completely different. And depends who you listen to. Um, You know, Dr. Jim Lloyd, the the dean from Florida, did a study that shows that there will probably be a deficit of 27,000, in this case, small animal DVMs by the end of the decade. Um, Blue Pearl had Deloitte and Touche do a study that showed there are 18 positions for every veterinarian looking for a job. AVMA contests those numbers. They say that it's not that high a number. Uh, but if I searched uh, Indeed last week, and there were 12,000, 11,000 and change positions for DVMs today. So there is definitely a shortage. The reason I tell you this is because you guys are in a great place. The world is your oyster. Even if it's not 18 positions for every job that you're looking for, you're going to have lots of opportunities. Uh, and I sort of feel like it's my job to tell you that, and again, this is not a, this is just me. This is not a corporation. It's not VCA. It's just me having seen this industry for 15 years that people are going to be throwing money at you. People are going to be throwing positions at you. People are going to be throwing contracts at you. I've heard of second year students already signing contracts for when they graduate, which is insanity. You don't know what your life's going to be like for the next two years. My boss probably wouldn't want me to say that. Um, <laughs> But my, my point, to, the first and most important point I need to, to get across, contract or negotiation-wise, it has to be a good fit for you. And if it's not, guess what? There are 18 other positions or 14 other positions or 10 other positions for you to look at. And that's super important. And it's difficult, I get, for you guys to understand that because you've spent your entire lives essentially trying to get into programs, trying to undergrad, trying to get into vet school, maybe getting into an internship. You're, that's all you've been working on. And all of a sudden, the tables have turned. Everybody wants you. And that's a great place to be. Having said that, I completely forgot what the question was. No, it was just your thoughts right off the back. And I'm oh. so sorry, I forgot to introduce A.K. Mitchell, our current VBMA president. Hey, guys. Happy to, to join on tonight and kind of share some some thoughts and questions that pop up as we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I love I love everything you just said there. And I love your thoughts of, you know, it has to be the right job, um, has to be the right fit for you. But I want to back up a second with regards to accepting that first job. Because, yeah, the contract's important, but I think it's the biggest mistake people make when they take the wrong job, and I've done this, everybody's going to do this at some point in their life, is unless they listen to me, and is that you you go into a job 
and you either don't identify the red flags or you identify them, but because you so badly want that job, you romanticize them. So you so badly want to be at that hospital because it's close to your gym or close to your boyfriend, your girlfriend, close to your parents. Uh, you so badly want a job. It's an easy commute. You're like, oh, I'm sure it was only this one time they used expired drugs. Oh, I'm sure it was only this one time they didn't get pain meds. Oh, I'm sure it was only this one time that doctor slapped the technician. And these are all things that happened. And you romanticize it because you want it. And so the best advice before you even get that contract is make sure it's the right job for you. Don't ever accept the position without spending some time in that hospital. Make sure you open up the drawers and look in cabinets and um, it be, be a wallflower. If you're standing next to the employer, she's going to know you're there and she's going to be on her best behavior. What I want is for you to be part of the wallpaper and listen in and see how they respond and see what that hospital is like when you're not there. And then make, I know this is a contract talk, but I just feel very, I think this is very important. And then the other thing is don't ever accept a job without asking the employer, what does mentorship mean to you? Mentorship can mean so many different things to so many different people. And what's right for one of you might not be right for the other. So they might say, well, what do you mean mentorship? It means, you know, I'll, I'll just explain as we go through. And that might not be the mentorship you want. Um, I want you to listen if there are other new grads or other doctors there. If somebody comes, asks a question, and the mentor just says, oh, just go look, go look it up, that might not be the mentorship you want. If, on the other hand, they say, well, you know what? Have you done a cystotomy before? And you're like, no. Well, your first one's on Tuesday. It will give you about a week to read up on it. Just do it, and I'll be there to, to help. Oh, wait, you know what? I'm on the boat that day, so you um, – I'll just call, just call me if you need me. I'll walk you through it on speakerphone. That might not be the mentorship you want. So make sure you ask, how are you going to mentor me? Make sure you ask, who was the last person you mentored? Because if they say every doctor that's worked here is a previous mentee of mine, that's perfect. That's exactly what they want. If, on the other hand, they say, well, let me think, Bill Clinton just got elected president, that's not what you want, right? You want somebody who, who has done mentoring before. Even better yet, ask a tough question to ask, and that is, uh, do you guys do any mentor training here? Meaning, are your mentors trained in mentoring? And that's a bit of a tangent before I get to your question. And that is going back to my first unsolicited comment, which is you guys are in the driver's seat. You can ask the tough questions. It's not easy. If they don't want to answer your tough questions, you don't want to be there. And if you are doing a working interview and you do ask them a medical question, they say, oh, I, I don't know, look it up. That's not the place where you want to be mentored for your first job out of school, right? And so make sure you ask those tough questions. Now, to your question. <laughs> the, there are essentially, I mean, look, you can get a salary, and that's your salary and the story. I'm going to pick a number of $100,000. You, you get $100,000 no matter how much you earn that year. There's also ProSal. ProSal basically works like this. Um, you're going to get a base salary of, let's say, $100,000. You multiply that by five. Whatever salary they give you, you multiply that by five. If you make more than $500,000, if you've earned for this practice more than $500,000 this year, everything over that amount is essentially a bonus you're going to get at the end of the year. That's pro sale. Most people will pay you 20%. It's usually a 20% model. But you need to ask, what is that 20% on? Because some places... If I see a patient and recommend they come in and get some Siloxin, and they come in two months from now and get Siloxin, I get the credit for that. So you want to ask, am I going to get it on refills? Am I going to get it on pet food? Am I going to get it on flea and heartworm prevention? What am I going to get it on? Now, some hospitals are a bit different. So, for example, if it's a 24-hour practice, if I admit the patient tonight, but, uh, Jasmine, you're there tomorrow, maybe you get the credit for it. Some places, the person admitting gets the credit. That kind of stuff sort of uh, goes away in the wash, but you need to figure out the percentage. What, what does that 20% count? If they give you a higher percentage, be super careful because sometimes, sometimes they can be tricky with that. We'll give you more, but on fewer things. So you need to find out what are you going to get on the recheck? Like, what are you going to get it on? Now, there used to be a thing called negative accrual. Some places still use that term. And essentially, they take your annual salary. Let's say it's $100,000. They divide it by 12. And then you need to earn that every month. If you don't earn it, you need to make up for it in the following month. The easiest way to think about it essentially is think of it as a bonus. And so if you earn that amount over the course of the year, 
that's what your bonus is at the end. That's the easiest way to think about it. Does that does that explain? And then, of course, you have the option, which is exclusively uh, production, which is dangerous for a new graduate. I think ProSal works because, well, I, I personally like ProSal because the harder you work, the more money you make. The only thing you need to be careful of is to make sure that hospital can support you. Are there enough cases for you to earn $500,000 a year? And so when you are there for that one day, it's tough to ask. But remember, I said, you can ask all the tough questions. If they don't want to answer them, you probably don't want to work there. And as a VBMA member or somebody who's involved with VBMA, you're familiar with how finances work, right? Like that's the beauty of the VBMA. You're taught all this stuff. And so what I would recommend you ask is, so if you're there for the day, roughly how much did we make today? And was that a busy day? Or was that a slow day? Because if you think it's a slow day and it's the busiest day they had and you crunch the numbers, you're like, wait, I'm never going to make half a million dollars a year. I'm not going to hit production. So you, you try to ask those questions in advance if you can. Most people aren't going to be that free-flowing with the answers, but you say, just give me an estimate, like roughly what did we earn today? And some people will show you the actual numbers of what they what they made that day. Was this an average day, busy day, slow day? And then you, you you do some calculations. This was an average day. Multiply that by 365 days or 300, you know, 15 days, whatever it is, if you don't do weekends. And then you can sort of figure out how much you're going to make. Keep in mind, the first six months, the first year, you're probably not going to produce that much because your spay is going to take you an hour if you're lucky. In some cases, your cat neuter will take you an hour. Uh, so just be careful with that. Did that answer the I, I I talk so much I for you know most people put their their speed back on double play with me they're gonna have to slow it down yeah <laughs> do that. I think you kind of touched on a few like red flags in the process of finding a job but let's say I found my dream clinic and we're sitting down and they're like hey this is our contract we would love for you to sign today what are some red flags kind of either throughout that process or in that paperwork? That. Okay, so we want you to sign today. That's a red flag right there. Nobody should give you at the end of the day. I would even argue that nobody should really give you a deadline. And that's sort of a trick some folks use to try to get you to sign on. You are in the driver's seat. You can decide when and how you sign it. And guess what? If it, And I know that the students, you're all freaking out. But if it doesn't work out, that's okay. There's going to be another hospital to look at. This is not the end all and be all of everything. So I would caution you never to feel pressured to sign anything never ever 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 sign a document without reading it thoroughly most of the corporates have standard contracts that they have used for potentially tens of thousands of associates most of it has been read by a bajillion lawyers and it's uh, they just change the name and in, in the numbers most corporate groups are not trying to screw you. They're not trying to, to, to give you a bad contract and bad faith, generally speaking. But again, don't ever sign a contract without reading every part of it. With regards to getting it read by a lawyer, and there's two schools of thought on this. Some will say, make sure a lawyer looks at it. And that's a contract or employment lawyer Make in the state in which you are applying. Because remember, there are changes in state laws for employment. So uh, some sort of contract lawyer can look at it. Um, my experience with lawyers has been, they will come back and say, I need you to change this word or add a comma here, or what about this? And 99.8% of the stuff, nobody's going to change because it's just legal terms. It's not that big a deal. And again, for most of the corporate owns, they're standard contracts. They're not going to change it for you. However, what a lawyer can find is, well, that's kind of a weird thing they asked. They asked if you leave within the year, you owe them X number of dollars. Now, odds are you would have found that on your own, right? But sometimes that's where a lawyer really comes in because they might find things that are a bit odd. I'm actually okay with signing a contract. Personally, with signing a contract, if I read it and nothing looks or sounds fishy to me, I'll sign it. But I understand not everybody feels that way. And so get a lawyer to double check it. My experience has been most of what the lawyers come back with, we can't really change because the contracts are, are sort of finalized. Was that sort of the question? Sort of the question. Yeah. Most important thing is never sign something you don't understand ever. And if there's a word that seems odd there, you got to ask them about it. Like, hey, what does that mean? 
back to non-competes. This is a uh, popular topic, the non-competes, and I get it. Many states have no non-competes, so it's not even an issue. They can't put it in their contract. Many folks will tell you non-competes are not enforceable. It depends on the situation. A friend of mine is trying to get out of her contract, and she has to pay a lawyer $600 an hour to go through her non-compete to try to figure it out, right? And some of the big players, maybe they count on you not arguing with a non-compete just because it will involve legal fees and you might not want to do that. So I get the argument of not having non-competes. My suggestion for you is if there is a non-compete in your contract and you think it's really over, it's too much, you can say, I don't feel comfortable with this non-compete. Can you reduce it? Or you can say, I don't feel comfortable with this non-compete at all. Can you get rid of it? And again, remember, you're in the driver's seat. If they say no, then you need to decide, is this a deal breaker for you? I'm not going to get into the, is non-compete right? Is it not right? It's a whole, I mean, I, both, are, both sides can be argued and has, have been argued by many, many people. Uh, the U.S. government's even looking at it right now. And that there might be a change. And then I guess now it depends on when you're listening to this. But anyway, eventually it might go away altogether and then there'll be an appeal. So I don't care about everybody. I care about you. So what I want you to do is read it. If it sounds reasonable and you're okay with it, then sign it. If you think it's not reasonable, then ask to change it. It's as simple as that. And especially if they want you, right? Like that's an important component. I'm going to... I'm going to tell you a little story, and it goes back to me telling you over and over again that you're in the driver's seat. It's a doctor I know recently met in Canada, and she was asked, she was recruited by a large specialty hospital um, to come work for them. And they made, her the, they made her the offer, they made her everything she wanted, uh, salary-wise was great, but she wanted eight weeks of vacation. She was given four in the contract. And she went for the last interview, a negotiating interview, and she basically said, I want eight weeks of vacation. And they said, we're not giving you eight weeks. We're going to give you four weeks. And she said, okay, I, on, I will only sign if I get eight weeks of vacation. And they said, no, nope, we're going to give you four weeks. She, they, she said, okay, I'm not going to sign. I don't want it. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, okay, okay. We'll give you the eight weeks, but your, four of them are going to be unpaid. And I love her response. Her response was, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And I tell you this because that's the mentality I want you to be in. If they're going after you, if they want you, if it feels like a right fit, and they now want to impose something that you don't feel comfortable with, whatever it may be, odds are you don't have the balls or lady balls to say, I don't feel comfortable doing that. But I want that to be in your head. I want you to think about that and think about what Odie told you. There are lots of jobs out there that you will find it'll be the right one for you. So I want you to think, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I love that line. By the way, she got the eight weeks. Another thing with regards to contracts and sort of negotiating. One thing I want you to be very careful of, if you have a salary you're not 100% happy with, or not enough vacation, or not enough CE, or not enough whatever, and you want to say, can we talk about it in a year? Don't ever do that. I'll tell you why. Let's say I'm the owner and I have no intention of giving you a raise in a year. I'll say, sure, we can talk about it. I'll be happy to talk about it. In my head, I know you can talk till you're blue in the face. You're not getting it in a year. So what I would rather you do is say, if I reach these milestones, whatever those milestones are, maybe if I complete a year, maybe if I can do a six-minute spay, maybe if I can earn, I bring in half a million dollars, whatever it is, I reach these milestones, can I then get X, Y, and Z? And then you put that in the contract. Make sure it's in the contract. If A, B, C, D, any of A, B, C, or D are reached, then employee will get X, Y, or Z. That's an important component to put in there. Just be very, very careful. We can renegotiate in a year. We can talk about it in a year. That employer might have no interest in coming in good faith. I'd rather you have it in writing. With production-based, often there are people who make a lot of money with a low base. Like I know people who make half, well, they make a lot of money, but they signed, they started 10 years ago at $60,000 a year and they're making 250, 300,000, but that's off of their production. So after a while, if you're on a pro sale, you're going to make more money based on how hard you work and how good a doctor you are. And that, by the way, is an argument sometimes comes with internships. People say the money you're going to lose that year and in the internship you're never going to make back. 
But if you're an internship trained doctor at a good hospital, you are going to refer far less. You'll be able to see more cases and you'll know how to do more things medically, which in the end, you're going to make more money off of production, assuming you're on process. So I've heard mixed reviews on the idea of a sign-on bonus. Do you think that's more of a new normal or is that a red flag of a clinic that has to pay that much to get someone to want to go there? That's a really good question, but I think in today's market, everybody needs to pay people to get there. So at this point, you know, 10 years ago, there was no such thing as a sign-on bonus. Absolutely not. At this point, I think everybody's doing it. Is it, could it be a red flag? Yeah, it could definitely be a red flag, but that's, separate from the amount of money they're giving you. You need to do your due diligence and figure out what's wrong with this practice. Mm -hmm. Most of the corporate groups are going to offer you sign-on bonuses. Many of them are now also doing retention bonuses, which is if you stay a year or two years or whatever it is, you get X number of dollars more. But I think signing bonuses has just become part of the norm. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily assume it's a red flag by any means. Okay. And again, it's something you can negotiate for, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. I guess kind of leading into the chat on negotiations in general, are there things that you've seen or heard of students negotiating for that others might not think to? Because like I had a friend who recently negotiated to get her Navli prep stuff covered, and I'd never heard of that before. Um, The most important thing I can tell you is negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. It's a female dominated profession, and yet women in many cases still make less than men. And I've been in a couple of committees trying to figure out why that is. And one of the reasons is women just don't negotiate as hard as men. And that goes into all kinds of other reasoning I'm not going to get into, but you need to negotiate. I think many students get a salary that they've never seen before in their life. A lot of numbers are like, yes, but you have no idea how much more, how further you can go with it. Even if you're happy with all the terms you get, ask for something, ask for a little bit more money. Ask for more CE days. Ask for more vacation days. If they can't budge on anything, ask for a signing bonus. Ask for a retention bonus. Ask for, at the end of, and put it in writing, at the end of the year, can you then send me to an ultrasound course, endoscopy course, a chiropractic course, whatever is of interest to you. And again, you put it, in, or Navali Prep, what have you, put it in the contract. I cannot overemphasize Asking for your worth and then asking for tax, right? Like that's, it is, you're worth it. And the market is yours. I mean, anybody, if anybody listens to this from the, from the employer standpoint, they're like, Odie, why are you getting on these talks and get telling students all our secrets? But I feel passionate about you guys. I mean, everybody knows this, like you have to ask for it. Now, sometimes they can't move. Sometimes you know, there's two different types of negotiators. You have some who want to, let's say, pay you 100000 So they will offer you 90 So you ask for 110 and you end up at 100 And then there are some people who will just say, this is as far as I can go. But you got to ask for it. Like, there's no harm in asking. Now, don't be stupid about it. Don't ask for an insane amount of money that doesn't make any sense at all. I once had one person ask for a signing bonus, the equivalent of her salary. So let's say it's a $100,000 a year salary. She asked for a $100,000 bonus. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, that's insanity, right? So just just be smart about the way you do it. Remember, $5,000 for a hospital, for an employer, might not be that much money, but it makes a big difference for you. And so ways you can say it is say, again, the most important thing is don't be stupid about it. Don't be rude about it. You know, I was really hoping for X. Is there any way we can get closer to that? I really want to be here. I love this practice. I can see myself here for the long term. I want my families here. My, I want to set up a family here. I want to be at this practice for many years. But I was really hoping for blank. Is there any way you can do that? If you phrase it in such a way, they, and again, this is assuming they love you and they want you, they might be like, yeah, let's do it. I mean, depending on your your confidence level, you can even say, look, $10,000 is not that much. This is a multi-million dollar practice. For me, $10,000 is the difference between being able to take vacation and not taking vacation. And so I would, the way I approach it is much more casual with regards to asking them to see if there's any movement. If anybody's dealing with a corporate recruiter, make sure you ask them, is there any way to get more? 
if they can't, if they say no, I would encourage you to ask, is there anybody else you can ask? Maybe you can get this for me. Because sometimes the corporate recruiters aren't as connected. And sometimes they can make phone calls to the person above whoever negotiated to see if they can pull something. And if they can't do, if they can't give you the more money that you want, okay, well, is it possible then to get more CE money or more vacation days or more, or, or send me to a course? You know, we just talked about. The important thing is to remember, the per- generally speaking, the person who throws out the first number loses. So if they ask you, how much do you want to make? If you say 100, which might be a lot of money for you, and you're embarrassed to even say it, they might be like, yes, because in their mind, they thought it was going to be 150. So try not to be the first. But what they're going to do, they're not stupid either, right? They're going to try throwing it back at you. And so you say, well, I don't exactly know what I'm looking at. What have you usually paid for people to do this role? Like, I know you have a new grad you hired last year. Roughly, what were they making last year? And they're probably going to fight you on that as well. And so then if you have, if they're really forcing you to give a number, I would frame it something like this. Well, I've been looking at jobs in the range between 120 and 150, depending on the other benefits that come along. I'll take a... So I'm just, that's what you, you phrase in your mind. You're thinking I'll take a 120 job. If I get three weeks vacation, I'll take a 150 job with two weeks vacation. I'll take a 120 job. If I get more, you know, two weeks of vacation and two weeks of CE and 150 with one week of CE. So what, I like the idea of giving them a range and stick to your guns, stick to your guns. You guys, I, how many times can I say it? You guys are in the driver's seat, which is a great place to be. In my day, we were desperate to get jobs. There weren't, there weren't, were, you know, there weren't enough jobs. Today, it's the opposite. I've had some friends uh, in the year ahead of me who have had recruiters kind of pit students against each other in the sense of like, hey, like we'd love to have you, but like we got to have an answer by this day, or like somebody else may beat you to it. Is that just more of a recruiting tactic, or because like, I? I guess I, can't as- speak, I, I mean, I can't speak to what the recruiters are doing, or at least I won't speak to what the recruiters are doing. I'm telling you, you need to take care of yourself. Okay. And don't feel pressured. Okay. There are somewhere between 10 to 18 jobs for everybody looking for a job. There's going to be something else. It's, it's, <laughs> if you ever break up with, if you've ever broken up with someone, if you've ever been broken <laughs> by somebody, you think it's the end of the world. More often than not, it's not the end of the world. And so that's the way I want you to think about it. That's what else you got? I talked too quickly. No. So for what I'm hearing and and processing from what you're saying here, there's a lot of, you know, first go find the right practice, go look at all the nooks and crannies, try to peek behind the curtain, make sure that this is the practice that's going to support you and your lifestyle uh, and your dreams going forward. Um, I'm then hearing, well, then after you have that conversation and they're interested in you and you're interested in them, sit down, take some time with yourself, make sure that you have a range of salary, make sure that you have benefits set and that'll help boost your confidence and asking and sticking to your guns in that driver's seat. Is there anything, I mean, is that, am I on the right track? Is there anything to add to that? Yeah. I mean, this is not so much for negotiating our contract, but when I talk to managers, and I tell them mistakes managers make when they hire somebody. The biggest mistake a manager makes or an employer makes when they hire they hire the wrong hire is they connect to the candidate on a personal level. Oh, you like horses? I like horses. Let's talk about horses. Oh, you like to travel? I like to travel. I just came back from Albania. Oh, I just came back from Albania. And you get completely uh, blinded by the personal connection uh, and all uh, objectivity is lost. And so managers hire, and I've made this mistake too in, early in my career, and you you just like-minded, like, like-minded, right? And so there's an old sales adage. If you're a former Marine and you're selling something door to door and the person opening the door is a former Marine, odds are they're buying whatever you're selling. And so I tell managers, don't do that. Don't connect to them on a personal level because you're going to lose all objectivity. What I'm telling anybody who's listening to me right now is do that, do exactly that. Connect to them on a personal <laughs> level. If you're a form, if you're a marathon runner and they're a marathon runner, they're going to talk to you about marathoning, marathon running. If you're a scuba diver and they're a scuba diver, they're going to talk about that. Of course, if you're CrossFit, that's all those people talk about anyway. So that comes up in conversation no matter what. Like if, if you see a picture of a beagle behind their desk and you had a beagle, 
growing up or you have a beagle now, you talk about that. And that's going to connect you on a personal level. You know what? Heck, it might get you $5,000 more. It might get you more. It's a, it's human nature. We like people that like us and we like people that are like-minded. And don't lie. Don't say you're a marathon runner if you're not a marathon runner because that will only get you in trouble. But don't ever go to an interview without doing some cyber stalking, right? Everybody has bios on their, on their website. Read something about them. Learn something about them. Try to learn about everybody in that facility as best you possibly can. And that's what's going to get you the offer that somebody else might not get. Or if you've already gotten it, to take you to the next level. I think in an ideal world, you know, you can, as a student, you get to go extern somewhere. You kind of have that time to figure out, is this a good fit for me? Is this a good fit for them? Um, how, I guess, I think a lot of vet students are scared of having to sign a contract sight unseen, um, or maybe the only contact you've had is through a recruiter or through like uh, email. If you're like cold emailing a, a practice, like how, what recommendations would you have for folks that maybe their externships ended up not being where they wanted to go and are kind of scrambling? I would be very careful. I would, I don't think I would ever take a job without visiting the hospital personally. I think that's a really, that's a scary proposition. I realize you don't have the time, you don't have the money. If they want you, ask them to fly you out. Take a day off of school, take a weekend. I This is hopefully a long-term commitment. It's the first, unless you're doing an internship, in which case you're in, you know, you have structured guaranteed mentorship. But if you're taking a job, this is how you're going to learn to practice for probably the rest of your life. And I would be really nervous about not visiting it. Are many students taking jobs without visiting the hospital, as far as you know? I think a lot of students, if their externships didn't work out the way that they want them to, end up in a tight spot of, I've used up all of my available off time, and maybe they only have a weekend. And I've heard the comment that a lot of places can look great for a day. If all you can make it is for a Saturday, like the practice owner can put on the horse and pony show and everything looks awesome. And then they find out it's really not a good fit for either side once they're already like a couple months in. Right. But it's even worse if you don't even have that day. Right. It's a fair point. Um, yeah. Everybody can pool a candidate for a day. There's no question about mm-hmm. that. But that's why I want you to ask the tough questions and open the drawers and listen to current employees and get as much information as you possibly can. I- I think my advice would be, and I realize this might be a bit contentious, this is a really, your first job is really important because it sort of gets you um, prepared for the real world with regards to what you're learning. There's a lot of stuff you don't learn at school and you kind of learn it from your first job. And even if it means waiting a little bit longer, even if it means spending additional money flying or an additional, you know, I don't know how to get extra days, but I think it's worth the investment for the first job. By the same token, the world is still your oyster. If it's not the right job, you look for another job. It's not like it used to be. It used to be you had to stay for a year. In today's world, uh, lots of people move because there's lots of jobs available. I just don't want you going into any job or into any contract with not completely open eyes. Get as you know, I my primary job is primarily with interns, internships, and so I tell every candidate, don't ever apply to an internship without speaking to an intern. No intern will ever lie to you. Don't ever, ever apply if you haven't. If, if, a, if an owner of an internship program says, I, can't, I won't give you numbers for interns, you hang up the phone right there. And then that's as big a red flag as you can. It's a bit tougher when you're applying for a job um, to ask, but I would encourage you to talk to associates, talk to technicians, talk to receptionists, talk to kennel help, talk to everybody. And don't necessarily ask them, do you like it here? Because if they like it, it doesn't mean you're going to like it, right? A restaurant recently, a waitress says, oh, try the... The peanut butter cheesecake is my favorite. I'm like, lady, I don't like peanut butter. I don't care. I do like <laughs> it, right? Like, so I want you to ask, this is how I like to learn. Would this be a good place for me? I like to spend an hour reading a case before I go in. And they might say, hell no, it's a terrible place. Or they might say, yeah, this is exactly what it's good for. So who would do well here? Who would not do well at a program like this? When you when you go home and, again, these are tough questions to ask, but maybe you ask some, a technician or somebody, doctor, when you go home and bitch to your partner about this work, what do you bitch about, right? If they say, oh, nothing really, I love it here, and explain why, or if they say, well, I always complain about how many hours I work, right? So, the, you know, they told me 10. You sort of want to get behind questions that sort of um, are camouflaged and to 
ask it that way. That makes a lot of I sense. Can talk about this stuff at all these different angles. I'm sorry if it's confusing. No, I honestly am like making so many mental notes. That's a great way to ask that though, to kind of get somebody thinking outside of just like, what would you change about your job if you could? Yeah. I mean, I like, is it what's called it? When I used to interview candidates, this was great to do for candidates. I had to figure out how to do it for an employer. So there's a reciprocity, reciprocity principle. So if I give you the opportunity to say something nice about yourself and boast, you're going to feel like you owe me a negative. So I would ask a candidate, if I was to call your reference, I'm giving away all my secrets now. If I was to call a, if I was to call a reference and I say, why should I hire her? And the candidates usually go, oh, I don't know. I don't know what she's going to say. I said, no, this is your job. This, you need to sell yourself. It's an interview. Sell yourself. What would she say is the three reasons I need to hire you? And the candidate thinks, and they're like, well, probably she'll say I'm really friendly and staff love me and I'm really good with ultrasounds. I'm like, that's great. Congratulations. So she would say, super friendly, staff love you, great in ultrasounds. But you know what, Dr. Odie? Just watch out for blank. And that's sort of a way to ask what's your weakness without asking what's your weakness. And you'd be surprised when I asked those questions, they would say, oh, she would definitely say I have a tough time getting up in the morning. I'm always late. I had one guy years ago say, oh, they usually have a problem with my anger management issues. So sometimes I go home and I go in the garage and I just have, I, I find all this garbage in the street and I just beat the crap out of it with a hammer or a sledgehammer or something. I'm like, ooh, good to know. Like nobody would say that in an interview, right? So I don't know how you flip that around. I mean, maybe you do just that. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, hey, technician so-and-so, hey, employer, what do you think the best things about this? Like when people rave about your practice, what do they rave about? Oh, they love the culture. They love the high quality medicine. And they love that we have two hours for lunch. Oh my God, that's awesome. I love that long lunch culture. I love all of that. But there must be something they complain about. What do they complain about? And you do it sort of reverse that way. They're like, oh, they always complain about Nancy up front, whatever it may be. I recently did a panel for uh, my school's interview week and I had, we had somebody that it was like the first question out the gate. They were like, what would you change about the school if you could? And it was crickets on the stage. Cause of course you got asked, you know, and, and it's not that we didn't share things cause everyone had right. a different opinion on like, Hey, like I wish we had more funding going to this area, um, et cetera. But it was that kind of like awkward pause of like, well, this is the foot we're starting on. Yep. It's fine. Yeah, I wouldn't do that as your first question, but definitely. And if they ask you, by the way, what's your strength? I always like to recommend a humble brag. I'm like, oh my God, I hate this question. I, I can't, I don't like talking about myself. But you know what? Now that I think about it, a lot of my reviews always say how how how, how they like working with me because I'm always so happy. Or a lot of my references often reference the fact that they love that I have so much surgical experience. So do it like as a reverse humble brag. With that, if we have any chapter officers listening, listening, I would 10 out of 10 recommend getting Dr. Odie to share his, uh, uh, yeah, like Mark, personal branding talk. That's what it was. Uh, one of my favorites so far, for Thank sure. A uh, lot, of, lot of good notes from that one. Happy to do it. I love the VBMA. I think in my day, a thousand years ago, there was no VBMA. It was a huge, I mean, I'm so, you were so lucky you have it, that it, ex it exists. There's so much education out there that people just don't get that you can get from the VBMA. Uh, when the VBMA first started, a lot of it was just students who want to open up their own practice. And that's no longer the case. It's just folks who want to get smarter about all these things that they just don't teach you at school. And the, the networking component of it is really what um, what helps. So. I think one cool thing that we've gotten to watch um, is kind of that shift from, I mean, these schools produce really good practitioners of medicine and really good surgeons, um, but VVMA kind of steps in to bridge that gap of how do I become that best, most well-rounded individual to go out and be a great member of whatever team I'm a part of, whether that is private practice or if that is corporate um, I do think there are some really awesome opportunities out there in, the, in both sides of it. Yeah, and it also gives you a chit, basically. You can go to an interview. I mean, don't open with it, uh, but say, you know, I've also taken the VBMA courses. I've done this stuff. So I, I understand why we need to be careful with our profit and loss statements. I understand how salary, I, I get it, right? And I mm -hmm. think they give you tremendous credit for understanding that stuff uh, because a lot of people don't. So again, it definitely, I, mean, I don't mean to be a sales pitch for VBMA. <laughs> no, feel free to. Uh, uh, I think everybody on the call has already drank the Kool-Aid, but uh, 
yeah, no, it's a, it's a great way to learn a lot of different things. And of course, my lectures are the best. So make sure you show up. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, Jasmine, I don't know if we had any more questions kind of as we wrap this up. Yeah, and I think I think you touched on it a little bit, just like to mention that you understand the things that the VBMA uh, teaches over time. So first of all, it's important that you understand it, and hopefully you learned it the same way it's important for you to understand aseptic techniques when you're, you know, when you're sterile techniques when you're in surgery. Like that's an important component. Um, there are ways to casually drop it. You don't have to say you got it from the VBMA because the VBMA is going to be on your resume. It's going to be on your LinkedIn account. So they're hopefully going to see that. So you don't need to, and I suspect, actually, I know, not everybody knows what the VBMA is. If you're talking to an old timer, they have no idea what VBMA is, right? And so I don't necessarily know you need to reference that, but you you definitely need to reference that you understand how that works. So for example, if they offer you a salary and you're like, well, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. I understand that. But, you know, I have taken a PL course and I understand why you have that number. However, I was really hoping for a number like this, something along those lines. Or even when you're asking for their day-to-day, you know, I'm curious to see, I know what you offered me, but I'm trying to figure out how much I can make a year. I know you want, you're offering me a hundred, which means I need to earn half a million. I don't know how reasonable that is. And yes, you don't insult them here. I mean, you, what you're thinking is, they can tell me anything they want. You don't know that. But I'm trying to calculate based on my day here, was this an average day, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, if you can ask them, you know, I've taken p l courses. I understand how to look at these things. Uh, how much How much do you guys earn a year? Like, what's your, what's your revenue? I think it's also um, a great space to kind of mention, like, hey, on top of a rigorous vac- bleh, veterinary curriculum, um i've taken you know 16 hours or for our honors portfolio folks i've taken 32 hours of additional business education to make myself a better um member of this team um or a more well-rounded leader within this space nicely said hopefully you're only applying to programs to understand what the vbma is i think you're a certain cohort that they sort of get it you'd hope generally speaking those are the the, i don't want to say higher quality but i'm going to say higher quality (laughs) Because so if they, they don't know VBMA, that is a red flag is what I'm hearing. It is, uh, <laughs> it is a small red flag. Yes, it's definitely. A red flag. You have to remember some people are limited where they can apply, right? If they're going, there's only three clinics in town and they don't know. It is what it is. But at least you know what you know. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I just caution you a little bit because sometimes I do get candidates and they're coming in hot and heavy saying, I know everything. So I've done these courses. I'm like, uh, maybe Yes, you know a little bit. So don't I wouldn't I don't know if I would push it too hard, but that's just me. Again, remember, and we're gonna probably close on this. They're gonna hire anything that moves. Like <laughs> you guys are in the driver's seat. There are so many I have a slide in one of my presentations, it's 65 or 55 of the current 70 logos of the current 75 corporate groups. And I and then I, I did this really cool thing when I make it look like a pie comes out and like you guys are the pie, and they all want a slice of the pie. And so remember that there's lots of people who are going to come after you. And by the way, I didn't say this earlier. I don't know if I would sign a contract when you're in your second year, unless you know exactly you want to be at that hospital, because your life's going to change. So be careful about that. I mean, you are in the driver's seat. The world, I mean, I've said this so many times, the world is your oyster. Everybody wants you. And that's a good place to be. Don't get snotty about it. Don't get arrogant about it. But you need to remember, years ago, somebody asked me, she goes, Dr. Odie, um, I'm I'm gay. How do I tell my employer that I'm gay? And I said, first of all, it's none of their business. Second of all, there's ways to casually throw it in the conversation. And if they decide not to hire you because of that, you don't want to work there anyway. And so it's the same thing. So if you don't feel that you're getting paid your worth through the negotiation, you don't want to work there. There are other positions to look for. That's my parting words. You know, let me and my yeah. Don't let my bosses listen to this because they'll be like, "Why?" Well, I'm mean, honest. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am so so grateful to have you as part of our <laughs> robust team. Uh, this evening. I'm grateful to you guys. For more amazing content like you just heard today, be sure to follow the BBMA on all of our socials at the BBMA. And join your local chapter. 